Hello, everybody, and welcome to Metaphysical Insights. I'm your host, William Becker, and I have a very special guest this week, uh, Mr. Darren Thompson. And um, Darren and his wife are wonderful friends um, who I've missed. So if some of you may be noticing, there's a, a plan to uh, my shows. They're, peop- they're friends I haven't spoken to or new people I've wanted to speak to. And so this is a great way to do it. <laughs> um, passive aggressive, but you know, it works. Um, so Darren, welcome. Um, it's great to have you here. Thank you. It's great to be here, William. I was I was honored to be asked to come on your show, and I looked at it as a great way of, I haven't spoken to William in so long. So yeah. much has changed in, in life and in, in the world that it's uh, been a while to catch up. Yeah. It's okay. I, for one, you've moved far away from the rest of us out here, but your house, I mean, your home is enough to move for to begin with. <laughs> yeah, something about uh, moving from Washington State to the state of Kansas, that the cost of living changed abruptly, and uh, we were able to actually obtain the dream house. Uh, uh, Jill and I visit New Orleans quite frequently, and mm-hmm. we love that architecture and the and the beautiful porches and the rocking chairs, and and so we found a house just like that in Kansas, and it's within commuting distance of my office. And full disclosure, I work at T-Mobile uh, in engineering and. Uh, when we acquired Sprint, I was able to then work at the other head office, which was Kansas. So I took the opportunity because all of our family actually lives in the East Coast. And from Seattle to the East Coast is basically a continent jump, like the end of it. Right. Uh, moving to Kansas put us right smack dab in the middle. Right. Well, don't you have Canada up north, too? Or fam- yes. family up north, I meant to yes. say. Yes, I have family up in Montreal. Yeah. And uh, the French province. Threw me out for lack of speaking French. Yeah, that's okay. The I was in the French provinces and they didn't know what to make of me. So, uh, well, I love I love what you're doing there. Now, how have you found the paranormal? Um, and De- um, Darren and I were talking earlier, and he's the science guy with so much of this. Um, with a you know appreciation for the metaphysics and all of the other pieces that go with it, but um, I just put it out there. He's really an expert with science. I mean, engineering the electronics—that's his job. So, um, but just to help put a, the perspective of what you do. But how are you finding things to get involved with, places to do? I mean, I know there are ghosts out there. Uh, actually, they were all moved to uh, Seattle and the Washington State area. Uh, oh, the, all the ghosts did? <laughs> yeah. I uh, hate it, to tell you this, but you've got one that for, didn't get the message. <laughs> so since I've been uh, – so through the whole COVID thing, I've been on conference calls and, and used this very same laptop in this very mm-hmm. same house because I'll work from the house more well, almost all the time for two years. Uh, and while I've been on calls, one of the people said, oh, who's that that just walked behind you? And I know there was nobody because it was early in the morning. I knew Jill was still asleep. And I just kind of, I don't know. You no, know, there's a guy in the back corner. But... Oh, yeah? Yeah. So our feeling in this house and our friends that have visited that are sensitive, because that's mm-hmm. the friends we hang around with, uh, right. they all picked up that there's a presence here or presences. And they're all just wonderful uh and and, it, and to touch on the 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 paranormal aspect when we first met our neighbors you don't lead with hi i'm a paranormal investigator uh right welcome to the neighborhood are you haunted so you, you let them bring it up and if they do then you you know talk about it and mm-hmm. they said oh, your house is haunted darren said, oh is it yes by a spirit that finds things that people who have lived here have lost possessions and they just kind of put it out there that I've lost my ring. And then it'll reappear in a place that, of course, is illogical, that they have obviously had looked or, you know, that type of thing. Uh-huh. And so they, uh, they just said that this ghost finds things for people. So if you ever lose anything, just put it out there. Fantastic. So, my so, ghost- so either it's safe from losing things altogether. We haven't uh-huh. really lost anything to, to test. Okay. Well, mine is good at moving 
hiding things and then putting them back after I get frustrated. <laughs> or things just popping up. I just put this, I, I have magic fingers. I can display the questions. And Eric Thompson was just wondering if he's uh, related. And since it's such a small world, I thought I would show that just in case you knew of any connection. So um, Eric, if you're on Ancestry.com, no, Ancestry, uh, I'm in there. And you'll see if we're related. Great. Thompson was a pretty common name. Mm -hmm. um, but I've, I've failed to find anyone with my uh, my heritage or, or my family tree that lives within any proximity of, of Kansas area. I've got a lot. Uh, so it, it was from Newfoundland, or I should say England, Ireland, and then migrated over to uh, Newfoundland. And Newfoundland was their way in. At the time, Newfoundland wasn't even a, a province in Canada. It was still a, a subject of the UK. So it's kind of weird. Is that, did they immigrate to Newfoundland or did they just kind of move within the UK and it just happened to be called Newfoundland at the time? And then from Newfoundland, they went through Montreal, the St. Lawrence River kind of passage there. Right. When did they come over? Uh Ancestry stores that for me. I like better for them okay. to keep track of it. But I think it's like okay. 1700, something like that. Yeah, no, I was just wondering. Because yeah. I've got one branch of the family that goes back a long ways. Ah. Most of it, I'm, you know, second or third generation born here. Okay. So, but one branch, we go back that far. Yeah. So. yeah. And the funny thing is Montreal, where I was born and raised, it was about 90 minutes away from the city of Ottawa in Canada, the, the mm -hmm. capital of Canada. And right. I moved to the city of Ottawa in the state of Kansas. And it turns out that it's from the same Native American or indigenous tribe from Canada that came down here. So there's actually some kind of reason. When you put all the data out there, you can always find a correlation. But I right. just thought it was pretty cool that it was kind of, I moved to Ottawa and some of my friends are going, oh, cool, let's get together. It's like, no, the other Ottawa. Right. Yeah, the one at 1,500 miles away from you. <laughs> yeah. Uh, well, it sounds like it fits you. But um, have you had a chance to meet up with teams to do some research? I know you're still working with Whisper. You're still part of TAPS. Mm -hmm. um, how, do you, how do you do all this, or how do you make it work? Um, um, where have you gotten to go? I'll just throw it all out there. Yeah, so since I've moved here, I, we, we connected with the group uh, at Wichita Paranormal, which oh. is a TAPS family group. Okay. And there's another TAPS family group that's located in Kansas City, Missouri. So there's Kansas City, Missouri, and Kansas City, Kansas. Uh, and they're on the Missouri side, which is like a, basically the state line is through the city of Kansas. So it's a misnomer. It's like they're in Missouri, so it's far away. It's actually, there's places in Missouri closer than places in Kansas. Right. Uh, and that group, all, all attempts to reach out to them has been just no one has responded back. So it's not uncommon for groups to kind of go quiet. Or, uh, and the group seemed like a small group to begin with. Uh, but we found, a, of course, who's always finding out about the paranormal and, and history. I, I always relate the two together. If a house is haunted, and this is from a, like a, 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 I want to call it entertainment aspect. You want to go to some place just to experience, and it's not really to help someone having a negative experience. Because mm -hmm. that's really what we we focused on was uh, assisting people that had a negative experience to help them get through it and to find right. out what was going on. Uh, mm -hmm. So the ones that are like the social aspect uh, is the historical societies here, and oh. so reaching out to them. Uh, to find out more about my house, uh, prompted conversations about other locations in this town uh, that have a history of hauntings or a, a good story behind it to substantiate that. And so there's a couple of places that I'm trying to get into here. And, and it's funny, is one of the main guys who seems to be most involved. I've yet to meet him, uh -huh. but I know who he is. And he's on my list uh, before the end of the 17th, before the end of this month. Uh, to set something up to do in July. We have a Excellent. bunch of people from Whisper coming down uh, to Kansas to visit us. So we're going to take advantage of having the extra people and uh, do some investigations here. 
I like uh, but it. there's the, there's other places in Kansas like Atchison has a lot of haunted places. Uh, when I went to Wichita, there's a place called Cowtown or Old Cowtown, and it's kind of like a recreation of a of buildings from that era, from the okay. homesteading, and they move them all to a property or to a lot, and so there's basically a couple of streets and cross streets of this old cow town. They have reenactors go in mm -hmm. and Wichita paranormal, they go, they've set up there and they are continuously monitoring it. Kind of like, oh. kind of like uh, Pete is doing at Port Gamble. Right. I was going to say, it sounds like the building. Walker Ames house. Exactly. So it's kind of that kind of a situation, but it's a whole village, multiple buildings. And they have multiple Excellent. trigger objects and tests that they're doing, and they'll have uh, they'll invite the public in. And so, on one occasion, when I was there to, to see a concert in Wichita, they said, "Come on down. We're going to be at the at the old Cowtown Museum. Uh, join us." So I did, and it was great. And we, we plan on doing that again. Okay. Yeah. Excellent. Um, yeah, I like that. And I was wondering, as you were talking, the question arose of to me, is the Underground Railroad close to you? Did it go through your area? Uh, yes. So there's a, there's a lot of so a lot of the uh, civil rights movements uh, mm -hmm. occurred around Kansas because during the Civil War, Kansas was one of the states that hadn't been claimed by the were were pro slave or anti slave. They were right. kind of independent. And right. so while they were coming up to decide whether they were going to get involved, there was a lot of people that came in and subterfuge to bias the decision one way or the other. Mm -hmm. so there's a lot of things going on there. And since they were an open state, a lot of the people were escaping the slave states to get into Kansas. So there's okay. a lot of stories and different um, bodies of water named after uh, these people that escaped and were killed or, or were found. And, and so there's a lot of history around here. Christ. It's difficult to find exactly where because it ends up being like a whole river. And they said that the river was always shallow. So the slaves would run within the river to get through. Right. It was like a, a wedge. Because Kansas is pretty flat. Yes, I've been there. <laughs> and lots of thunderstorms in the summer. We saw beautiful thunder and lightning most every night. Um, hot and humid enough that when you're traveling in a pick up and camper without air conditioning. You don't care if there's thunder and lightning, you're going in the pool um, <laughs> with the campground because, you know, we stay in campgrounds. Um, and you hope there wasn't a water moccasin down at the other end of it. Um, mm -hmm. But uh, yeah. it's, it's, a, it's beautiful in its flatness. As the weather's long as you're wonderful. Not, uh, yeah. I'm from Montreal and Jill's from Ohio, so it's, we're not uh, a stranger to snow. No. And we were expecting more snow than being in Washington state. We were in, yeah. Isabel, in Washington. So it's pretty like the, at the foothills of the Cascades. Right. Uh, and the snow was, we get it once in a while. It wasn't that bad. I've snuff shoveled more snow when I was living in Washington than I have since I moved here. Wow. It just hasn't been that, not, not that much precipitation, but boy, those electrical storms, Ooh, baby mama. Yeah. Uh, the, the storms would come in and the thunder would be a continuous roar. It wasn't distinct claps of thunder. It was just a, uh, it's a very, very different. Uh, yes. And when the wind comes in because of the planes, it just, it goes crazy. It, it'll be huge electrical storms, the weird uh, lighting, like the pink green kind of colors in the sky. And uh, there's been a couple of times where we thought maybe we should go in the basement. But the yeah. warnings have faded and it's been okay. But so good. far, so good. And then I think Jill just posted a auto yeah. has been protected by Native American shaman. It was said that this Native American blessed the land to say that no great loss of life will ever occur here. I guess by nature. That's fantastic. Yeah. And was that before the settlers or? Yes, when it was their land. So okay. Ottawa was founded by the. The Indian said, we will grant you this land if in exchange, when you build the university in Ottawa, that you leave places for Native, for the Indians, Native Americans to actually attend this school. Oh. 
So that still is to this day uh, occurring. And Ottawa University is one of the older universities around. And it's still, I guess, the major uh, reason for the city of Ottawa. But then when okay. I went back to the deed records, the lot of land that they sold for, uh, where my house exists was to uh, enhance the university properties. Okay. And I went back to 1860, uh, a little bit before that when the land was uh, was purchased. And then my house was built. This is the second house in this lot. The first one burned down. They leveled it and rebuilt it in 1911. So my house okay. is from 1911. Okay. Be interesting if the Underground Railroad went through your the first house that was there. Yeah. Because it was a prominent doctor who owned the property where mm -hmm. the house is and the property beside there. Yeah, so it could be. I was, it's Frankly, it's exciting to me that at the time a university honored the commitment to the tribe and left the spaces for tribal members to attend the university and still are. I mean, yeah, where everything else is kind of like, yeah, we said we would do that, but mm, changed our minds. Yeah, here, have a blanket with smallpox. Um, <laughs> yeah. So uh, that's, I mean, that's exciting to me because of just so, well, it's part of the discussion to show that not everybody's bad. Um, yeah, and Jill's saying their education was free, right? Yeah, correct. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it was a good deal. It was a good mm -hmm. deal for them. And, yeah. I like that part of the history too. It's like a, yeah. a good part of history. Yeah. Because there's it's, so many, like, the, the names that they have is like Bleeding Kansas and the Dust Bowl. And there seems like there's, do you have any like real great things that happen? Like the festival week or something? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I mean, even it's even a state away from the, the musical Oklahoma. I mean, you don't even get that. <laughs> yeah. uh, but um, and you were talking when we were meant talking a little bit earlier. The people you said sound sounds like everybody's really nice. Um, so the people that reach out are nice. The people that haven't come to me, I don't know. <laughs> okay. But if I look at where we lived before and the neighborhood and the the houses around us and who we knew, who we interacted with, who didn't interact, uh, I've got to meet and know more people here than I did in the 20 years I lived in, in uh, Seattle. Okay. Which I thought was funny. I, I just, I didn't see Seattle as like, I thought Seattle was open arms and, you know, open-minded and welcoming. And I just think they're busy. And they just yes. don't have that fiddle-faddle time to talk to people that aren't part of my life. Yeah, I think you're right. I think that's a big piece of it. Well, even where I live right now in the Portland suburbs, I know my neighbors slightly the mm -hmm. two that were here when my parents lived in the house I know a little better the ones on the other side I introduced myself when they moved in but I can't remember their names you know we wave yeah but they have little kids I don't I mean it's our lifestyles everything is so different um, yeah. there's just nothing really to bring it together but. yeah and being here I've learned the fine art of uh, lawn husbandry didn't have a lawn to really worry about now I've got a big fancy John Deere riding lawnmower just like why would I ever need a riding lawnmower but I do here for the property that we have so it's it's a rather large piece and so yeah. when you're out there the neighbors come by and and people stop and you turn off the lawnmower and you sit and you talk and so it's, it's a very community oriented and there's always something going on on the main street here of Ottawa of uh, this festival or or, or other car car drive throughs and uh, it's been interesting. I haven't been involved as much, uh, but I'm looking into volunteering at one of the local auditoriums here. So that gets me the music, because I played music right. in a previous period. Uh, and that's one of the main places that has hauntings. Oh, sure. A long history of, 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 uh, of occurrences that I okay. won't go into detail with because I want it to be, no one know what's going on when we do it. Right. I like it. Yeah. yeah. It's, it's, again, it's small, it's small town. Mm -hmm. uh, 
I like that feeling. Uh, but the, for the touch on the metaphysical, the people that I've spoken to, although it has the the air of being very religious and not metaphysical, mm-hmm. when you talk to the individuals, and, and we say this at every conference, it's like, oh, no, I don't believe in that kind of thing. But the other day, like, there's always a story that yes. gets relate to unexplained phenomenon. Uh, and and that's the same here. Uh, so many people have a story, and there's there's been a definite interest from the people that we've spoken to about it. Uh, so Excellent. it's kind of be, uh, difficult to get something together. But it's just so with all the moves and everything, it's been uh, it's been interesting trying to get everything back into a normal, where you have lots of extra time to do that. Right. Most people don't realize how much time is involved in doing this. It's not just, it's, you know, it's, it very rarely is it a full-time uh, profession or a job for the individual. It's all right. voluntary. Right. Yeah. Unless you've got a TV show. And, <laughs> yeah. You know. Yeah. yeah. Uh, and even then, there, there's, there's so much about the different TV shows, depending on which one it is. What are they doing? Are right. they really helping? Or is it, we all know it's to get ratings, to get advertisers, to pay to, to advertise money. on that show. Yeah, it, it's, right. it's totally monetarily based. It's yeah. not about, you know, it's not a PBS. We're helping people. We're saving right. lives. Yes, yeah. exactly. Yeah. Well, and was, for- was always helping people, being able mm-hmm. to uh, turn things around so things were better for people that were experiencing right. paranormal phenomena. Well, and and all my technical thing, people always say, oh, he's technical. He doesn't believe in anything. It's like, no, I just want to know if there's a way of if you see spots, if you see lights at night when you're watching TV to your in your peripheral vision, if there's a reason that you could see spots in your peripheral vision that can be explained medically, wouldn't you rather know that it's a medical condition and it's not a haunting? So well, I'd a, at least want to take care yeah. of it if it was a medical exactly, condition. Exactly, exactly. Yes. But if it's if it's something that if you have a way of understanding its actual reason for being and not living in the fear of what you thought it was caused by. Because right. the, the biggest, most detrimental aspect of people experiencing things and the unknown is fear. Once yes. you're afraid of the activity, everything that happens in your life from that point on will be attributed to that activity. It will reinforce your belief that it is paranormal. When if you didn't have that activity going on, that same occurrence wouldn't have been attributed to the paranormal, but right. it becomes this, you know, curse. And that's why it happened. And so it's so, why well, was in so many cases, it's been the turning around of their experience or perception of the activity that it's, a, it's paranormal. It's probably evil. And then once things are exposed, that it's like, it's a little child spirit and it sees you as its mother. So when it interacts with you, it's tapping on your your apron strings or, you know, around that level of your waist. It's like, so it's not like the devil. I'm the no. devil. Poke. Yeah. <laughs> it's like, it's like, not trying to push you down the stairs. It's trying to give you a hug. Yeah, exactly. And uh-huh. when that avenue is opened as a possibility and it changes your perception of the activity, then all those other things that you related to paranormal are no longer attributed to the paranormal. And then the activity is usually, you know what, it's not so bad, I can live with that. Right. It's it's just being the the open ear to mm-hmm. offer alternatives. And there's metaphysical alternatives of what you can do as, as you would do at the spirit counseling. But there's also the technical things of your, your house is poorly shielded, you're sleeping beside an alarm clock that emits high levels of EMF, and that can cause symptoms Right. So let's remove the clock and see what happens. Yes. And if it removes it, this can up. affect your dreams at night or your yeah. feelings. Um, yeah. So I always felt it's very, very important to do both. Yeah. Use the technical to eliminate the things that can be eliminated. Mm-hmm. I'm reading Jill's message. I am too. Yes. Oh, nice. Yeah, kind of like a town hall kind of thing. So we've been meeting some of the people that we find out that, you know, it's just the, the lady who does your hair or the guy who cuts, cuts you know, that does things, service, that they're also involved in the community in different ways. 
And so one of the guys is a, a local radio host for the AM FM radio here in town. And he was very, very interested. Okay. So I, I don't want to step on the gas. Right. That fast, <laughs> but I know it's there. Yeah. Oh, good. I'm glad. Um, mm -hmm. Well, it's such a natural part of life to me. I mean, I know I'm a little unusual, but um, it's how could you have one part without the other part? And, you know, you've got the breathing part and the non breathing part. Mm -hmm. And you've got history. There's got to be some kind of a reaction or an imprint from that history. W whatever it is, I mean, there, there's got to be something in there that ties together. Mm -hmm. And so I'm curious, I've always said the observation on the cases we've worked that the people that typically contact us have a higher sensitivity to the spiritual realm. Okay. And the people that they live with maybe don't have any spiritual, they don't have that sensitivity. And they claim that we well, don't see this activity going on. And I don't like to make the person think that it's just them, meaning they're crazy and they're just making stuff up. I mean, I think that all people have a, a, a an ability to be sensitive. Yes. I, I agree with every psychic who's ever said that. But I think there's different degrees of it. Yes. And the people that are more acute will be the ones that react and, and are a witness to it and will make comment of it. So I think that spirits are all around always, but mm -hmm. I think people just don't have that sensitivity that it doesn't, they're not aware of it. Right. Is that no, I, your feeling? That makes, well? yeah, it makes perfect sense. I think you're right. Um, and that's part of what I talk about in presentations and mm -hmm. classes too, is that we all have abilities. It's part of what kept us from getting eaten by saber toothed tigers and hit over the head by the neighboring tribe, you know, um, especially back before we had language. And, and guns. Oh, yeah, and way <laughs> before that. <laughs> that helped with the saber toothed tigers and the clubbed neighbors. <laughs> yes, exactly. Um, <laughs> kind of the wrong periods, but okay. Um, but I like being able to work with people too and that helping them to understand because you're right, it's the fear of the unknown that's the problem. And once you can take away the unknown piece of it, um, the fear usually goes away. And I've had a lot of people I've worked with that wanted whatever it was there gone, which mm -hmm. is not something I do or really believe in. I, frankly, I've never seen it work. Um, there are people that will disagree with me, and that's fine. Um, but I, once they've known what was there, and it wasn't some malicious um, being that wants to eat their souls for breakfast, mm -hmm. um, they're like, oh, yeah, well, we, as long as it stays out of the bathroom while we're in there and lets us sleep at night and you know don't break great grandma's china bowl and then we're cool and i said well you tell them you don't need me to tell them you tell yeah. them <laughs> and it's good um so that's part of what i like about it and yeah. i like people i'm i don't do a lot of investigating the way you guys do i i go with teams sometimes who want a psychic and i wander around and talk to dead people um then whoever else is around i've and, seen you talk to the living as well yes i do do that on occasion <laughs> and um um it's that's what i enjoy i like to build i like meeting people mm -hmm. breathing or non-breathing it doesn't matter that much yeah. and um so and then once they don't want to talk to me anymore, it's like, okay, I can go home now. Um, I've had chairs move and I've had things disappear and I've heard things. Well, shoot, that's just my house. Um, and so I don't do it for thrills. And I like to help people. I mean, I honestly do. And if I can help them understand or 
you know, developed, I love to teach, but um, the, the meeting and getting to hear the stories of the people that were here before us, um, even it was some kid that died of an overdose 15 years ago or five years ago, um, mm -hmm. whatever they want to tell me, it's, it's an honor. Um, and so I feel, I always feel honored when they want to interact in whatever way, yeah, including moving a chair. Right. And that's kind of one of the things that I, and everyone who knows me is going to roll their eyes. I kind of wish I was more gifted with the sensitivities to be able to identify a feeling with like a, an entity, as, as you've indicated, like the story of an individual, where I've had instances where I felt things or did something or said something that was based on just the environment around me. Like, oh, I better leave the room. That girl doesn't like to, the girl that they were communicating with doesn't like me. And I just blurted that out obviously without any thinking it's like i don't see there's a girl i didn't hear what you were talking about so i still don't know it's a girl and why would i think that she didn't like me when i walked into the room but that's kind of you know here's your emf meter girls i'm leaving because she doesn't like me uh, and they all kind of said well that's actually what it was and so it's like okay so I, that happened <laughs> yeah but it which is the level of, of you know i knew it was a young man and this is what he was going through and, and something so it's like all that but that's a start and you can go from there. Yeah, and I'm always open to it, and yeah. I don't like work on it, but I don't work against it either. Right. And so and I've always appreciated that intuition may not just be my logical mind putting together the best course of action, but it could be influenced by outside bodies. And as long as it doesn't cause harm, if the decision was wrong and I follow it, then I'll take the chance. That the typical reach an intersection, I can get home turning left or turning right, and I go the way I don't normally go just because I didn't feel that I should go the other way, I will completely respect that. Yeah. And go the wrong way. Yeah. Just because. And you never know. You, you may not hear of anything that happened, but the reason that nothing happened is because you weren't there at a certain time. Yeah, exactly. And the plinko it game of life even happened to you. Choice. Yep. And something mm -hmm. changed. Yeah. Very fascinating. Because I get, I still work with some of that on which way to turn or whatever and which is my mind and which is intuition speaking but i'm pretty good with what's imagination and what's psychic as far as the rest of it goes the brain feels different yeah and and i imagine you're more tuned into yourself and what is self and what is not self mm -hmm. but i've been working on it for almost 50 years it's about time it you know I need to... <laughs> so you know it's and that's something for anybody it doesn't matter what you're doing if you if you want to get in this field and if you're an investigator relying on equipment if you're want to be working as a psychic if you want to be working as both or whatever it takes time you have to learn yeah you have to learn yourself. Yeah, everyone and, says, yeah, because you are the instrument. In, in my, you know, engineering opinion, you are the instrument. So you have to know how you work to know mm -hmm. when you're deployed in the field, when you pick up things, what that means for you. Uh, right. And one, one thing I like to stress that any, any, when I do a talk on the technology is know how your equipment works. Yes. Because if you think this little meter is detecting spirits specifically a ghost and your meter goes up to a three or a five there's no one in the world that can equate that scale to oh it's a level five entity or it's a ghost or it's a spirit because the meters were made for a specific purpose and when they trigger it's because they are detecting what they were supposed to detect right mf microwave uh, house wiring uh, mm -hmm. the temperature guns they they touch the surface they look at when you shoot across a wall, they look at the temperature of the wall, not the air in between. So right. no one can say, a spirit just passed me. My temperature gun dropped in temperature. Because all you can say is your temperature dropped because the wall got colder there for whatever reason. But right. how do you know it, what it was? So they're all tools to aid in identifying what can be identified. EMF, 
rose or fell. The temperature right. rose or fell or fluctuated. And you can record these things, but they don't equal it was a ghost. Or a Ex exactly. Could be the cause of it, they could have caused that reaction, but in and of itself is not evidence. It's right. just, it was always the goal of let's track as many points of data as possible. And when something occurs, when somebody feels the presence and that person is known to be accurate, mm -hmm. what parameters that you're recording changed. Yes. And then if you can relate that every time you've sent something and that parameter changes in the same way, then you can relate that this is a good indication of something could be occurring. Yes. But I, I shudder when I watch all the new TV shows, the technologies yes. they deploy. And I just, I, Jill is probably sick of me just yelling at the TV going, that doesn't make any sense at all. That's right. not even possible. And they're mm -hmm. selling it for like thousands of dollars. And it doesn't do anything like what they're saying it does. But people are buying it. And you go online. To, let's face it. We're a Google society. Right. You just say a word, and I don't know what it is. I want to know what it is in about five seconds. I'm going to type that yep. word, and Google's going to tell me. And when it's the paranormal, anyone who posts a message, it'll be part of that search possibility. And so the person who thinks it's your aunt, that's going to be in the search. Somebody who thinks it's because of bacon is crisping funny, that's going to appear. So all these possible definitions will appear as a possible answer. So you mm -hmm. have to kind of like, this doesn't make any sense. Exactly. It's frustrating when people are, are enveloped in fear because they obtained this meter that gave them a result that the TV show said means this. Yes. Thank you. We're in complete agreement. Um, then, like we were talking earlier, the shows have a – and I'm not trying to bash anything. That's not my purpose. But you have to remember, anytime you're watch, watching commercial television – the purpose of commercial television is to make money. Yep. And sensationalism sells. And that doesn't mean that you can't have complete truth in TV shows. And I'm not saying that there aren't shows that can be completely truthful. Um, I'm just saying you have to look at the, the motivation behind the whole process and then do your research. Um, Exactly. And do some research that isn't just Wikipedia or something. I, well, I'm a, I'm old school and I'm used to going to the microfiche catalogs and the card catalogs at the libraries at the university or archives and digging and being able to see, okay. I know where this book came from. I know the validity of this source or not. I know that the name on it is really supposed to be on it, not um, because AI someplace is playing around. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> I know I can trust this, or I know I should be suspicious of it, or... Um, yeah, this person write it, wrote it, but this was his agenda. And um, people, you know, you have to be aware of all of that. What was that? He'll make a left turn and talk with the client. And I look at him I'm like, what is that about? He was correct. Oh, yeah. That's a, 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 our classic. I'll do a lot of the interviewing in, uh -huh. in to clients. And right. I'll just say, so... You know, what is this thing about baseball? Or, or I'll ask a question that, that Jill will say, that's not our normal questions. Why did you ask that? And then the person answers in a way that's like, well, it's funny you should mention that because that's kind of like what precipitated the activity. And because, you know, there's always like what changed in your right. life? Nothing happened until. And please explain what else was going on in your life at that time. And, and so I, I, I guess we call it psychic interviewing. You don't I don't know what I'm going to ask because I don't know what I'm going to hear from you. And it's kind of like just uh, trying to be open. You know, the, the art of questioning or interviewing is be open so that the answer isn't a choice. Right. And you're also, it's a sign of good listening. Because you're listening, not 
and will respond to what you hear. Sorry, what is not you you're listening <laughs> and hearing what oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> Well, sometimes t things freeze up. I thought I didn't come through. Yeah. <laughs> uh, I feel so sorry for Jill. Um, <laughs> but, but um, you know, you can tell when somebody's not listening, they're asking questions so they can say something. And um, when you're responding to what has been said, instead of something that you've already got set in your mind mm -hmm. um, makes interaction with anybody better. Yeah, the art of speaking. Yes. <laughs> I would Long imagine ball. it even works better with pets. <laughs> it's been a while since I've had one. Yeah. <laughs> but, yeah. Oh, great. Well, how did you two get involved in all of this to begin with? Ottawa? No. No. <laughs> I, I've always had an interest. As a kid, if there was a book about the mysteries of the Bermuda Triangle and the keeping your razor blade sharp under a pyramid and pyramid power and Eric Van Donegan's Chariots of the Gods. And so I was always into all those aspects of the unknown and, and ghost mm -hmm. stories. Was to read right. a ghost story and, and as it unfolded and what happened, it was just the possibilities of like what's going on it's and it may have scared you and that was sometimes the purpose but others right. were just this is my story and i'm sharing it with you so i just love that aspect and i can't speak for jill for everything she did in her childhood but uh, when we got together we had a great interest in the paranormal uh, and the first thing that we did was when you move to a new city you kind of visit around the place oh she right. said my house in ohio was haunted that's yeah. right i remember talking to her going there's ticking in the wall seems to be moving. <laughs> uh, so when we arrived in Seattle, we attended, we went to the underground tour. Okay. And at the end of the tour, you pop out to usually a gift shop. Uh, but in this case, there was a bulletin board that was saying that there was going to be a paranormal conference going on. I was like, what? There's actually something called a paranormal conference? It was like, there's enough to actually have a thing about it? And so we, you know, pulled the little tab off like you do on garage sale finds, you know, a little, you know, call me at this number with the date and we saved it. And then we attended. And so, and it was Agos. Agos was having their, their uh, conference. And so Jill and I attended. And then when they did the, the technology of the paranormal, it's like, what? There's technology for the paranormal? And my eyes were big like saucers. Like, I can't wait. And Dutch Jackson was the one doing the presentation. Ooh been in the paranormal for a very long time. You know, I don't think I know him. Oh, no. He's yeah. just sticking around. He's, he's still out there. And yeah. he opened up the suitcase, and it was all these tools. It's like, that's a temperature gun. That's a microwave detector. It's, it was all these things had been bent into detecting paranormal. And so it was fascinating of, of how the theories of this equates to that. And so I became more and more involved, Jill and I both did. And I ended up leading the technology in a ghost for a period of time uh, and to teach people how things really, really did work and make Good. sure that we were using it, it was used properly. Okay. Uh, and then in 2005, we both left a ghost to start Whisper. And it was one of those, the way we wanted to do things and the way that a ghost were doing things were different mm -hmm. rather than always feel like, uh, you, you don't want to be the oyster, you know, the, the causing change through, through friction. Right. It was easier to you do it the way you're doing it and you're doing it well. And we're going to do our thing and do it in a different place. So we don't have this, you know, friction of, of whether it should be this way or that way. Right. Because it's your group. Let's you do it the way you do it. And so then we found a whisper and, and then continued doing it that way. Great. Great. And how are you keeping up with Whisper now? Uh, so we have uh, Melinda and Rick are there, and they were our lead investigators for a lot of the activity, and Melinda being one of the psychics, the sensors in the group. And so they're okay. leading Whisper in Washington State. But, of course, we're still – most of the stuff was, uh, I guess, procedural mm -hmm. in arranging things, setting things up in research, and that can be – COVID has taught us we do a lot of things remotely. 
Right. And so we've been able to do that. Uh, the, the, the reality and the amount of cases that we had during COVID dropped significantly. And in communicating with all of the other uh, groups in the TAPS family, it was a similar scenario. There just wasn't that much activity. And I should yeah. say, in Washington State, uh, uh, Jill saying it, it was also Beth, uh, Angie, and others too. The majority of the team is still there. Right. It was Jill and I that moved. So they're right. still there. It's a very strong right. team. Yeah, but you're still connected and working with them. Oh, correct. Yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. And, well, as much as I'm concerned about some of the online research that's available and the issues of fake information from it, mm -hmm. it does help with a lot of, when you have towns whose archives are digitized, you can, you can from halfway around the world, go in and find some of the history of a plot of land or you know look something research is is any uh people involved you could find out a little bit about them uh to see uh then then the, the geography of where they are and the history of the places that they are is something that mm -hmm. can be done remotely uh, but we don't do everything for them but we we really want to facilitate that they can do everything mm -hmm. Because yeah, the interviews, there's nothing like we can call them up and talk to them, but there's nothing like the face to face of looking into somebody's eyes. If you're in fear, just calling somebody is, is better than nothing. Mm -hmm. But being face to face is is a big difference. It is. And even with a video call like this, where we can still see each other, it's a lot better than just audio. But it's not the same as if we were sitting in the same room. Exactly. Because you'd be uncomfortable with the fact that I have nothing on besides this shirt. Where in person, I would be uncomfortable. But on video, it's fine. Yeah. Now, I, I, you don't matter. And, um, you know, I, I, I do the reverse mullet, I guess, in a sense. Party, <laughs> you know, business on top and party on the bottom. In my everyday around the house shorts that I don't let anybody see. You know, <laughs> actually, does your camera, can you move it down? Because I haven't actually seen your lips through our entire conversation. Oh, I'm sorry. How's that? <laughs> it was, I wasn't sure how the, uh, I felt like you were my neighbor looking over a fence talking to me. <laughs> okay. <laughs> sorry about that. And sorry about that to everybody out there. Um, I need to pay more attention to that, I think. Um, but, um, uh, yeah, and Eric said that's why we need our own database that not corrupted by online. Um, that's tough. Like, that was always a challenge. Is we've had a lot of talks with, in the community. It's like we should have a database of all this information. It's like, but what? It's so difficult to determine what data is is like. If you had to write a list, of what are the ten things that you need to have in a database? It would just keep on changing. It's it's you don't know. Uh, what right. point of data is relevant or important for a while it was like make sure you check the temperature before you do the investigation because you need to see if the temperature drops and it's like well the moon phase is a very big effect on the things or the tide lines around the closest area are very relevant or and so there's all these points are possible but they're finite like what do you determine is important to track and put into that database Right. And to me, it's like no one, you can't, I don't think you can dismiss anything. You have to look at the actual thing of what's going on and what's happening and then kind of find the points of data. Then the next case, you go on and see the same things. And do these points of data change? Does it have an effect? And it's only over years of evaluation and review of what parameters actually could have been an influence or an impact on the situation. Right. And how, who's the one to set the standards for collecting the points of data? How do you know that person A is collecting and recording and observing them the same way person B or C is? Yeah. Um, yeah. yeah. It's a very good question. That was part of the conversation. Be, like, yeah. If, how do you ensure the integrity of the data captured unless you dictate exactly how the data needs to be captured? Yeah. And then it becomes a little... Oh, I'm not doing that. That's ridiculous. And, uh, mm -hmm. you could, I can get down to the details of 
the specific serial number of the hardware you're using could be defective. How yes. do you know? Well, especially when you're working with people who 98% of which are not engineers mm -hmm. and who do not have a real technical background. And um, that's nothing against anybody. It's just um, stating that there, you know, most people don't have the ability to just open a box and take a check at something and know the full details because it's not their normal job description. Yeah, correct. And, and the way they're using it is different than how, how it was designed. Uh, mm -hmm. So if you learn how to use it as it's designed, that's great. But how do you relate that to paranormal? Uh, right. Uh, is, there's a little mm -hmm. bit of interpretation in how to do that. And when you see a difference, what does that mean? And I think it's as different as places in a house. Uh, different houses will have different, different results. Uh, EMF is something I always think should be looked at and checked. Mm -hmm. uh, Cliff has asked, what are Darren's thoughts on EVP recorders that pick up voices that are not heard by human ear? That has always been a challenge. It's a, I've always played in bands and music and did recording of bands and have gone mm -hmm. through the uh, tape recording of bands. So having a, a piece of, of tape going across with magnetic particles being charged, manipulated, and, and it's like, so an EVP was recorded on this tape on playback. Was that sound existing to be recorded or was it impregnated on the tape simultaneously? Or like at what point? And so with audio, you could say this is the erase head. This is the recording head. This is the playback head. You could physically see there's gaps and how it could be added to or included in. Then we went to digital. And everything I thought about for analog was just blown away. Because right. digital didn't have all those pieces. And so it's basically the recording mechanism had received the signal. But the transducer or the microphone that uses air vibration, like as you speak, the, the air is moving and then mm -hmm. the recorder picks up and interprets. Well, that's analog, the piece of moving with the digital of translating that to one's nose. So the ones and nose have the EVP, so this moved. Well, right. we experimented by cutting off the microphone. So it's just a tape recorder. Well, there's just a recorder. There's no analog, it's just digital. So the EVP should be able to impregnate themselves somewhere. And we've never gotten an EVP when the transducer was removed. So that little microphone thing is moving. Right. We didn't hear it, but it, it picked it up. So right. EVPs have always been very fascinating. The fact that how do you say it's the voice of the dead? Is it the voice of my subconscious, your subconscious? Don't know. But it's definitely a voice that can't be explained. And we've right. received many EVPs on investigations. And what I like is to analyze, because we did a lot with microphones, where we would investigate and put 10 microphones in a building. And if we picked mm -hmm. up sound, we could tell which microphone picked up that sound. So we could isolate the location which of the 10 places was it closest to? Okay. And so there would be a handheld microphone in a room where the person said, did you hear something? And on playback, their voice recorder on their, on their body, because we made the investigators wear a, tape, a recorder on their, their body, keep on calling them tape recorders. You heard an EVP, but the microphone that was right beside them didn't pick up the EVP. But the proximity, you know how you could tell if something was talking close to a microphone or far away? There's that right. kind of echoey, distant thing. You could tell whether somebody's close to the microphone or not. And it sounded like they were so close to the microphone. But yet it wasn't picked up by the microphone that was just as close. So it's definitely the ability to impregnate the audio recording with that spirit voice that just isn't picked up by the human ear. And these transducers are sensitive to the range of hearing. So if you can't hear it, they didn't design the recorder to pick up that frequency. You can't hear whale song. You can't hear high frequencies on the microphone because the transducer just isn't designed to pick it up. It's too expensive. They make it to pick right. up the 20 to 20K that the humans can hear because that's what, what I'm going to record sound I can't hear for. So right. uh, again, knowing the limitations of your microphone will dictate the limitations of what can be recorded. And then if you heard something, it had to be within there. 
Uh, so there's been lots of research on infrasound and ultrasound and, and how it's being communicated. And, but yeah, EVPs have always been very fascinating. Yeah. Yeah, they, they are. And I don't get them, but I've heard uh, some of the best I've heard have actually come from very busy, noisy places, too. And usually it's not during the EVP sessions. It's in between, okay, group, we're going to go set up in another room. And it's when there's casual conversation that it picks up. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, I was just saying it depends if it correlates to the personal reason for investing in help. Yeah, it's at Starvation Heights, one of the most compelling EVPs is we pulled up in the car and we actually blindfolded the psychic. So they didn't know where they were because we were mm -hmm. just like the Amityville of Washington State. You right. pull up in front of the house of Starvation Heights, people go, oh, I know where I am. And then all the preconceived data and notions that you have of that will be in your head. And now mm -hmm. that's going to be picked off the shelf for what you felt. And there's too much bias. So we removed all bias. No one knows where they are. Right. And when they arrived, the videographer was in the back seat because I wanted to prove continuity. When they left Denny's. <laughs> the sponsored by Denny's, the home of haunted paranormal investigators. <laughs> <laughs> and when we left Denny's, we were recording the ride to Starvation Heights, while the driver, who wasn't psychic nor blindfolded, took <laughs> did the drive. I was wondering about the blindfold. <laughs> yeah, the psychic would be blindfolded, and then the uh, person recording it on the video camera was sitting behind them, so they could just let it roll and hear them talking and just jabbering about whatever. Uh, and also make sure that no one mentions Starvation Heights. Right. So there's, there's a couple of intentions behind there as well, just to make sure people were uh, not knowing what they're arriving to. And right. so when we arrived, okay, everyone get, there's like three or four or five cars. Everyone stay in your car. Let me set things up, and we're going to prepare for that. So they're in the car waiting, and on playback of the the, the video after the after we had done everything, we heard, help us in the EVP and it was one of the very clear uh, and that's always subjective you know I hear it all the time and but if I tell you what I heard then now you're biased to think you're looking for that word and you go yeah I hear it too if I didn't tell you you probably still hear that word right we did lots of tests with that blind studies where listen to these 10 recordings recording number one we're going to play it five, five times you tell me what you heard and so individuals would listen to it for the first time and write what they heard, not what someone told them they thought they heard. So it was interesting to see how many people heard the same thing and whether it was mm -hmm. just our subjective bias or truly was the logical choice of what those words sounded. Uh, that was one where we really felt it was direct to the spirits on Starvation Heights that had lived this, this tortured existence. Uh, and we always felt that uh, Linda Hazard's spirit still resides there. And it's still ruling over the, that as the spirits, because my my guess, for lack of a better thing, is that when the spirits were starved to death, they kind of diminished slowly. It wasn't like your lights were snuffed out. You were sick and right. just got weaker and weaker to the point that you weren't existing anymore. And her spirit is still kind of keeping them there as, you know, no, you're, you're just three more months and you'll be better. And a lot of them were still trapped because of her or just overbearing uh, personality it ex existed in the afterlife. Wow. Yeah, very, very fascinating case. Yes, uh, that, that is interesting. Um, that's a place I haven't been yet. And I probably wouldn't be very nice to her if I ran into her. <laughs> See, I use. Oh, did I move that VIC. too fast? I don't know what VIC player, but to play back, we're able to change the frequency level to listen back. So changing. So the original audio is in the in the it's been digitized or is, is captured by playing it back at different speeds. It's slowing down or increasing the speed, so it makes the pitch higher or lower. But it can't make a sound. So if you were a little bit above hearing and you reduce the sound in half, you would then be able to possibly hear something on the upper end. Same thing for frequencies that you can't hear below 20 hertz. If you increased its speed, it would double instead of being a it would be a So it could bring some of those okay. border sounds into hearing range. 
but the transducer concept is if the transducer can't pick up anything below 20 hertz, there's nothing there to pass through the microphone to be recorded and digitized. So, but playing with speed is, is sometimes good where if the voice being spoken is slow, not low in frequency, but slow in cadence. You pick that up in speed, now it's help us. So it makes it a little more coherent. Right. That makes sense. And yes, you can. And Jill will provide you with my email address. When Jill hears this in the delay, she's listening in another room because I can okay. hear, <laughs> but she, I hear her respond to things like laugh at something a couple of seconds afterwards. Okay. Well, there's a little delay that I've been noticing too. That's part of why I've talked over you at times. I haven't meant to. Um, it's just the way it, the electronics work occasionally. And we've had a couple freeze ups. Ah, you're a wizard. You spoke and it happened. <laughs> Oh, that's great. Um, I, yeah, I was wondering your opinion about those two, because I've heard some really good ones. Um, a lot of times, not much. Photos, I've seen a few that look like there's something. Mm -hmm. to, and I'll be honest, I take a lot of video because that's how I take notes. Um, if I have to stop and write, then I lose my train of thought and my connection but I can speak so out loud and keep it going and so I do that and I don't even look for EVPs or videos or pictures because I've had them when I've asked so many times they've said why the blank should we go to all that work and spend that much energy you can see and hear us and I say yeah but I can't prove it unless you do something and it's like, well, that's your problem. Yeah. <laughs> so, if, you it, if you had the EVP, would that be evidence for everyone? Right. It would be for you, and you already hear them. So right. actually what the Spirit said was dead on. Yeah. <laughs> you know, it, it could help give me some confirmation about yeah. that I am picking up what I think I pick up. Yeah. yeah um, that's because you I am... You're I, assuming you, you're hearing them as they are meant to be heard, but in fact, maybe there's some interpretation unbeknownst to yourself. Right. Yeah, makes sense. And if you ever run into a medium that says they're always right, please run, not to them the other way. Um, I like to walk. I don't want them to chase me. <laughs> That's like even better. Backwards. Yeah, like you would for a bear. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. But the um, question about photography is huh? without being the one taking the picture, it's so difficult to give because people send pictures go, what do you think it is it's like well right 90 of the time it's going to be an orb and i'm not saying that orbs are always dust they are not always bugs but i don't know which one your orb is so right. being of technical mind and i did a lot of work with photography and work with forensic photographers on this is caused by like lens flares and a very bright light reflected off the aperture and the color of the lens flare will appear as the color of the orb if it's lens flare orbs. And right. if it's dust, the, you know, the particles. And so it, I did a lot of research and there's the, uh, there's a group in the UK that did a fabulous research on, they had a flashlight, a video camera, and they just let it play. And then they would show how the dust motes as they floated through how they looked in the camera images. And they would show that if they were so close to the lens, it couldn't be in focus because your camera can't focus this way and far. Right. So it would become fuzzy, round even, because it was so out of focus. And it wasn't opaque. It looked transparent, translucent. Yes. But you could see the dust mote was floating down. You could see the correlation of this is what dust looks like. And it looks remarkably like so many of the ghost orbs people are submitting. Mm -hmm. So it's easier for the for the sake of evidence or proof that if you see it, an orb, 
I can't prove it's it's spirit based. So I'm going to dismiss that as evidence. Now, if an individual said my my uh, loved one passed away and this was taken by his graveside and I felt his presence and there's this orb by my head, I'm not going to say dust orb. I want to say that's a beautiful thing. What a great experience that you've had. Right. And typically, they're not trying to prove it's paranormal. They're just sharing that this happened with them. So mm -hmm. I can't dismiss that it's always a bug. Right. But if I'm doing an investigation, I'm going to dismiss it immediately. And with video and night vision, orbs appear all the time. That's just a photographic anomaly of using night vision. So there's so many things that uh, there's a couple of threads I've seen on YouTube where people are posting the, the love of my orb and here it is again. And here and it's like, it's just crap. And by I yet, know. Is somebody watching it, like there's no like uh, judge and jury for this evidence has been reviewed and is valid. It's like just somebody feels it's real and they published it as being real. And I just hope people have the, the good sense to evaluate whether it could be false. Right. Yeah, no, it's. Um... Oh, and my last thing that just drives me nuts. Everyone has that that uh, the connect the old Xbox connect where you have the video that sends thousands of infrared beams of light and it tracks the human body. And then if you put it in a room where there's hauntings, you will see the spirit walk into frame. You will see it sitting in a chair. You'll see the investigator reach out, and then this little digital stick man reaches out and tries to touch the investigator's hand. It's like, it's unbelievable. So did a lot of work on this. Microsoft hired these Israeli software developers to track the human body of specific, like the wrists, the elbows, the shoulders, the main body joints. So when you're playing a game, it knows what to look for. Oh. <laughs> what was happening was it would, and it says use it in a specific size room like 10 by 20 make sure the lighting is sufficient and make sure the room is empty so it's just the individual that's playing the game okay so now you introduce a chair well that kind of looks like you're breaking up i can't an ankle that kind of looks like a knee and that kind of and it tries to build. You froze. Hello? Darren? There Are people out I'm there. Back. Okay. Yeah, you're a little jerky back, a little fuzzy, but. I know I'm back, but I don't see you. Back. Can you. There. Can I what? I think I'm back. Okay. Now you're back. Okay. Now I hear you. Oh, good. Yeah. Yeah. So just to, I don't know where it cut off through my my Xbox thing, but investigators are using it in a mobile fashion of walking around. So now the 10 by 20 room, you're not following that rule. And the room right. is not clear of objects. The room is filled with chairs and the individual is part of the scene, part not. So it is designed to pick up the human body frame and assume it's a player. And because of the America with Disability Act, it has to assume that maybe the person doesn't have all their limbs. So someone who has okay. one leg can play x -Men's. And so it will try to fill in the blanks where it can't see. So these people using the Kinect cameras in haunted rooms is the lighting is wrong. The room is filled with objects. And the, the poor software is just trying to find people. So any any line that looks like a, a joint or something is going to be de determined to be a person. And then you're going to see this little person stick figure doing weird things. So. Every time I see it, I just cringe. It makes me want to retch because it's very expensive and mm -hmm. it's cool as hell. Mm -hmm. uh, but it's zero value. Right. There, I feel better. Probably good for another Yes. Six. Yes. 
Excellent. And it's so good to hear that because you see, I didn't realize all of that. I'm, I'm older. We didn't have video games when I was a kid. Um, and I have never gotten into them. So um, I don't know how much of that works. Uh, but it's, it's good that someone's trying to take something that exists and mm -hmm. use it for other purposes because there isn't a ghost detector. Right. There isn't a spirit sensor. So to take something that does work and, you know, doing something and see if you could apply it. So I love the concept of applying it. Right. It's like it's but there's so much that says this isn't it isn't doing what you think it's doing. And if people think it is doing what it's doing now, they've actually got confirmation that there's a spirit that sits in their living room with mm -hmm. three legs and a, and a jittery hand. Right. That. Yeah. Yeah. It's it's a, a bit, people get so excited and I get that, but um, sometimes I want to give all would be investigators a critical thinking class or two first and then a class on analytics or yeah. just, you know, analytical thinking. Because that was one of the concepts when we talked about databases, we went so far as if there was a database, how do you ensure integrity? And it was kind of like the investigators would have to follow some regime of how to investigate and yes. make sure that they're doing it this way. So it's kind of like it would be so controlled that most groups are very independent and they're already doing something that that most people think is not relevant or isn't professional. And so you're kind of just doing the best you can with what you have. To put that, to put that uh, etiquette in place of how to do it, we felt that no one would want to do it. They would just well, accuse us of, you know, being in charge and trying to take over. And it's like it, the, the reality is, if you want to capture data, you have to have integrity. And if you don't have right. integrity, then you might as well stop capturing data. Exactly, in integrity, but also um, the ability to know what's true data and what isn't. Yeah. Yeah. Exactly. And. Um, I remember conversations going on around the community during this and who was going to set the standard, who could be the, the boss of it, or, you know, the, the idea of the paranormal certificate and the training to be, um, you know, we'll train you how to be the, the perfect and give you the certificates. I think some of that still happens, but how, whose idea and how and what? Um, yeah, it was deemed there's so much fracture uh, or lack of coordination amongst mm -hmm. all the paranormal groups that to have consensus of how things should be done would never occur. Yes, I think that's true. And that's not necessarily a bad thing because we want experimentation. It's just we want true scientific experimentation that uses some kind of control. It has to be repeatable. It has to go through the whole scientific process. And people have to learn what that is before they say they're doing it. Exactly. Yeah. And there's a lot of resources. I've seen so many groups try to establish a paranormal investigator training. Mm -hmm. And they're all good and they'll all have value. Right. But it's that person's interpretation or, or philosophy. And and if you go through the community of all the different groups that, that we've been encountering uh, around the world, as well as North America, is each group is very unique. Even amongst yes. the, we're part of the TAPS family. TAPS does not dictate how to investigate or how to mm -hmm. capture data. Uh, the only thing they do is they make sure that a background check has been made. So you're not sending people that shouldn't be in a home of a stranger. So right. making sure the integrity of the people that, you know, that we've been vetted that we're the people that show up at your house or at least don't have a legal background that's to be questioned, that they're, they're okay that way. Um, but beyond that, each group is different among the TAPS families. There's a range of how they investigate and how they do things. Uh, many of us following what TAPS does or has done. And I've always looked to their technology uh, to see how they're using it and employing it. But even they've used that like, Xbox Connect device mm -hmm. investigations. It's like guys know, and and I I worked with them for a period of a week at Northern State Hospital, 
Okay. And so we got to, to sit with the team and talk to them and they are plumbers, police investigators. They're, they're just regular people like most of us who have this bent towards investigating the paranormal. So they take equipment from other people and employ it as they think it should be employed, but they're not subject matter experts on all the technologies they actually employ. It's like, right. I don't have to know how to build a hammer to use a hammer. And that's kind of the concept, like the cameras. Uh, I've seen some great things now with high speed digital cameras to be able to capture motion that maybe you missed because your frame rate's too slow. Right. But yeah. a lot of this is very, very expensive. Yes. Mm -hmm. And it, some of those I've seen at least, um, I haven't seen them up close and in person, but on television or something where they can pick up things that we, that just aren't seen otherwise. And when you go back frame by frame, something shows up. Um, again, I'm not there, so I can't, and I don't know the people. Yeah. Um, so I can't tell you um, how accurate, how good anything else is. Um, but it's interesting to see. It's like maybe they possibly found something because you always hear about night vision. You can see in the dark. So if a spirit is there and we could see it if we could see, but we can't because it, which is just not visible to us. So they play with infrared and then there's the full spectrum cameras. And so they're playing with the levels of light that are below or above what we can see to see if mm -hmm. it can see it because it interprets that and then right. equates to something we can see. So night vision, you can see as if you your eyes were open and the lighting was in the room, but it's yeah. infrared light and the same thing with ultraviolet and other frequencies. So they're they're tapping into what is it that we can sense either by hearing or by touches harder, uh, by by sight or, or scent, and how do we expand the range that we can record that? So either with microphones that are pickup infrasound or ultrasound, mm -hmm. or video that can do uh, infrared or ultraviolet and see if it's seeing things that we can't see. And thermal right. imaging was the other one where it's seeing heat reflection, which is not visible at all. Right, uh, and but we have to be careful about where that's coming from. Like, is it reflecting off of another surface yeah. and it's you or your cameraman that it's reading? Yeah. Well, my guidance is wave. If the spirit waves back at you, it is you. Uh -huh. Unless it's delayed. Unless you wave and it waves later, <laughs> then it is the spirit. Uh, yes. It's like thermal imaging. If everyone had one, it would be common sense. Like you don't use your flash taking a picture through a window because you're just going to get a picture of your flash reflected back at you. Thermal right. imaging is similar in that if you're thermal imaging at a window, it's going to reflect things. It's not going to let you see through it. So right. you could have a lava field blowing through and pressing against the glass of your house. You won't see it on thermal imaging. You're going to see your reflection. Uh, mm -hmm. So things like that. And it's not just mirrors, but reflective surfaces and how that works and different materials. If you have drywall versus aluminum sheeting versus so even the substance or the, the surface material will play a role in what the, the thermal imaging reports. But we learned yes. so much with thermal imaging. And the way things bounce around and, and do, I've had just in my own home, I have saw strange reflections or sights, but it's a clear story light or window in one room reflecting down a hallway that's kind of bouncing off of something else mm -hmm. that's putting a piece of something over here. <laughs> and that's what the reflection is. It has nothing to do with anything paranormal. It, it, it's a lot of the photos I've seen have fabulous light anomalies and it's not mm -hmm. like a bright light. It's distorted like a Star Trek kind of a glob of life that's floating and it was a uh, cellophane paper from a cd container somebody had taken it off unwrapped it and put the cellophane on the ground on the on the tabletop the sun hit that it reflected and reflected that light all over the room right it just looked like this ethereal light anomaly and i was like move that paper and it's like and the light anomaly moved with it it was like i think it's the wrapper <laughs> yeah <laughs> but amazing effect that that fools us how did that yes. happen it's got to be paranormal i can't explain it and that's the key 
because you can't explain it doesn't mean it's paranormal. It means maybe there's a reason and you just right. don't know what that reason is. And so yeah. I, I've, I guess, spent my life fascinated with these things and trying to find out why things happen so that I can say that probably isn't paranormal because I can explain it, duplicate it, replicate, you know, scientific method. And so mm -hmm. let's dismiss that for now. And, and it's not to dismiss the person's claim. It's to be able to assist them in understanding that it wasn't Satan spawn, but right. cellophane. Mm -hmm. See what I did and, there? And there are certain, yes, I'm impressed. <laughs> <laughs> and, you know, there's sometimes um, when explaining a pro uh, how something could have been done the x y or z doesn't mean it was um with cellophane and moving and that's a pretty clear indication um but i but you still you know you can, there have been times i've seen um explanations that have said well we can do this we found how to do this mm -hmm. so therefore it's definitely not but i think um it's better maybe to some in those cases say it probably was not paranormal um yeah it, and I, I get what you're meaning and, and my intent is never to dismiss your claim right. it's to offer a viable alternative to what like there are things that can explain that and then it would be, you know, check uh, if it happens again. Is there cellophane? Is the sun hitting something that would reflect or refract light that could cause that? Do you have a, a crystal by a window that just at the right time of day, the sun hits it and it, mm -hmm. it causes some anomaly? So you, it, it's only true to you if you prove that that's what happened. Right. Uh, you can only offer like check for things like that. And yes. because I don't just because someone said, oh, no, that's this. I hate that. I hate it to be very dismissive. It's like, yeah, tell me what my options are and then let me investigate those options for me. And then right. say, yes, I accept that. If that's what happened or no, it still isn't. So because paranormal, just because if paranormal phenomenon occurs and it looks like something that can be explained, it doesn't mean it wasn't paranormal. That's like, right. It does look like a bug. Maybe the spirit mm -hmm. looks like a bug. <laughs> that's what comes yeah. on your camera maybe it does yeah. reflect like cellophane on a tabletop uh, so right it's it, it and it's anything you have to look at it in its entirety what was we always had a when someone is reporting phenomena we always want to know what what was going on about 10 15 minutes before that phenomenon occurred because oftentimes there's like a catalyst or a trigger where you right. just arguing with somebody did you just have the best day of your life it, did it just have an electrical storm and to 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 ask them to think about what happened 10 or 15 minutes before would possibly highlight those things if it happened in a regular frequency every three days say then every three days they'd have a 15 minute window of what was going on prior to the event right uh, in some cases it's been a, a physical action uh, uh, an emotion that was higher in, in intensity than normal or it could have been just the presence or lack of presence of someone, uh, right. a family of four, and that one person, every time he leaves the room, things happen. Or said another way, when that person is present, activity never occurs. Right. Uh, and if you can identify this, then you start to be sensitive to it and then notice that, oh, Jimmy's going to the store again. Get ready. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Exactly. Jimmy's going to the store and uh, put on your hard hats. Here come the, book, <laughs> the rocks out of the ceiling. <laughs> yeah, very, very true. But every case, every scenario was always unique. It wasn't like, oh, yeah, it's a situation number three. Mm -hmm. you know, the same old. Was, everything was always different. Yeah, that's part of what I, th I find interesting about all of it. it. It's a good question. Hmm. I have not. I don't think I have. I mean, I visit different times, but I'm aware I'm visiting them at the time. Um, and I lose track of time or every once in a while you <laughs> yeah. find that, oh, how did I get here from, but I have ADHD, it's normal. 
<laughs> you know. <laughs> yeah, I've I've never felt that I've lost time, but your example of where did that time go? Yes. It, that there's never enough time. I don't know yeah. if I have ADHD, but I, I definitely have more things that I want to do than the time to do them. And so I, I multitask a lot. I've got multiple things going on simultaneously, and I'll go over here and do that. Well, that does its thing. Then I'll go over and do that thing over there, and then I'll go down and do this over here. And Yeah, that's great. Yeah, and for me, it's just I can be off in a different zone in my own head and then realize, oh, wait a minute. Okay. But so I don't think that's what you – Cliff is talking about. Um, I know people that seem to have time jumps where they've gone long periods, uh, you know, a couple hours or something that just seem missing. And with somebody, they've both been in the same car or mm -hmm. that kind of thing. Um, and there are people I know that are honest that I know they're not lying to me, whether or not they're interpreting things correctly. Mm -hmm. I don't know. Um, but so it's an interesting question. I mean, it's. Yeah. And I think of uh, the story of Travis Walton uh, with the alien abduction, who we've mm -hmm. met on multiple occasions and Jill sat down with him and, and talked to him. Uh, okay. He definitely had a, a jump of time where time just, he was gone. Yeah, and and that's this is great because I hear of things like that, but I've never talked to anybody who's experienced it, and you have, so you can get the feel of this person too, and know if it's somebody that wants notoriety or somebody who's telling the truth. Um, yeah, it, it, he was somebody. He was. He is somebody that has not benefited from the notoriety of having an alien abduction. He's mm -hmm. suffered his entire life family oh, and friends it's kind of like he just kind of he had to just be honest and tell us truth and he's been nothing but ridiculed by it uh, as horrible. of late he's been attending the ufo circuit uh, any conferences uh, so uh, we attend as many conferences as we can the latest being the skinwalker ranch uh, uh phenomicon in utah it'll be the it's the third year they run it and we're going to be there for the third year that's just been a great conference to meet people like that uh, to hear about it. And the other one was the um, McMinnville UFO Festival. And that's okay. where we first saw Travis. But Travis was at McMinnville, uh, was at the um, Phenomicon in Utah last year. Now, Travis is, that's the, Travis Taylor or Travis the abductee? Uh, Travis the abductee and Travis okay. Taylor. They were both there as coincidence would have it. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Because I know, and then I know him only from, the show when I actually get a chance to watch it. And I don't know what to make of it. I've, um, they actually do have the district attorney on and di things like that. So mm -hmm. these are people that um, you would think wouldn't be on a show that's spouting out a bunch of rubbish. I don't know Travis's universities. It looked like one of his PhDs is a mail order which in physics seems a little bit weird to me, but I don't know. I mean, those aren't my fields. Yeah. I just, I, when I heard that he had been on this, the chief scientist for this government UAP thing, I thought I'd do some looking to see if it was true. And yeah. I haven't, I didn't get very far in it. I found one channel, something news that said it, but I don't know that station. It wasn't local. Yeah. It was local someplace. And then I looked him up online and saw a list of, and I didn't recognize most of the schools and such. So I don't know. I, I, there's no reason. I don't know all of the astrophysics schools. Yeah. And so, I know from uh, meeting them and talking to them at the conference that History Channel put him in the show. Because History Channel said, why are people going to listen to these bunch of Utah farmers uh, or security people or, you know, agents of you know the people that own skinwalker ranch why should we have a show with him we need some name here and so he was on the ancient aliens and anything to do with ufos on his history channel was okay. travis taylor the physicist okay. in, in in astrophysics and you know uh and so he was introduced to them and he's like the story with they introduced him 
uh, they all sat in the, at the around the table and Travis Taylor was like, you know, uh, I'm a, I'm a scientist. And, uh, what's going on here? Like, what are your degrees? Where are you, where are you educated from? And it's like, well, I went to university locally here in uh, agriculture. And it was like, they didn't have the scientific accolades of him. Right. But Eric Bard, who's the, the chief investigator that's on site, I, I sat down with him and talked to him about his studies and what he's done. And he's hands-on worked on projects for, uh, the, the, the uh, chemical composition of batteries and battery discharge and the characteristics of batteries. And he goes deep into the technologies of real life stuff and okay. companies like come to a resolution for things. So very analytical. He's into big data. He wants to record okay. data. And what they do is yeah. they capture and store all of their data. So it's their data, their methodologies being employed and they just keep on adding new technologies from third party fields to come in and do their evaluations. And I love the technologies that they're using and yeah. the concepts that they're investigating. Kind of different than than what we would do for spiritual investigations, but yet there's a lot of uh, carryover from the Bigfoot field, from the UFOlogy field, where the things that they've had happen seem to correlate to things that are spirit-based as well. What the, the, the sense, uh, that somebody's present in the room, the, um, uh, the psychic getting the message to leave, or right? Flight or fright, but there's more content. It's not just I got to run, but I don't know why. It's kind of like right. you be here, please leave, kind of thing. There's a lot of that type, and they're using the same technology. We're gonna look at EMF, and if there's an mm -hmm. EMF change in the field, because that could be a correlation with the alien participation. A lot of orbs or um, self light emitting objects that aren't reflection because they took the reflection piece out they're not broadcasting light to get light reflected like orb phenomenon it's they are passively looking and seeing the light meaning it's being right. transmitted by the object uh, but fascinating it's just nice to meet the people and all the except for him the scientist uh the rest are just regular working men that have been in the industry working in technology or uh, like Thomas Winterden, he's just the, like the radar from, from MASH. He's right. the guy who knows everything about the Uinta Basin. He's a business owner there and a contractor. And whatever they oh, need, yes. to get it. But what they did was when, when they bought the ranch from Bigelow, mm -hmm. they didn't want to let anyone know who owned it. So Thomas Winterton was on all the documentation as the owner or representative. Okay. So it was the physical face representing Skinwalker Ranch before they revealed who really owned it. Okay. Like, this has been just a hands-on guy and we've met his wife and his kids and they just, they're promoting Skinwalker Ranch. It, that place has made you into base and every year they have a conference and they're making more and more money from people coming in and supporting local businesses. So he's part of the business group of the Uinta Basin to help promote business. Fantastic. So he's using this to help the town, but his conference isn't to raise money, it's to raise money within the comp in, in within the city. So the phenomenon people aren't making money. Everyone's trying to do a conference to make money. They're doing right. a conference to bring business for everyone to make money, to benefit from the participation of everyone. So That's it's fantastic. been one of the best conferences I've attended in a long time. Good. Now, do they actually go out to the ranch? In the conference? Because of legal liability, they won't let people on the physical property, but they'll bring you as close as okay. they can. Like, basically, you're, you're like a fly on a screen. You're allowed to stick to the fence. <laughs> you can't go inside. Uh -huh. The biggest thing is they give you time with themselves to, you know, talk about the things that they have experienced and where they've experienced it. And, more of the background of what the TV show can't, because they'll show, you know, we did one, we had the doctor ride in a Jeep with GPS, and then we did it without the doctor and did the GPS ride. Look at the difference in data. It's completely different. And I'll say, like, why didn't you do it like three or four or five times? And they said, oh, we did. But the TV show can mm -hmm. only, you know, we're going to edit it. We're just going to reduce it. So there's so much work. You've got 40. Yeah. Yeah. Because it shows. Yeah, go ahead. Oh, go ahead. No, you go. You first. Uh, the the show's got 45 50 minutes to cover a week and they're not able to put in 
everything that's done in that week in that show yeah exactly yes they're constantly doing experiments and things of course they're packaging it for tv but they'll say there'll be like hundreds of hours of tape and so little gets actually televised and so they mm -hmm. it's like it's a disservice to the world that but we, it's a tv we have to work within its constraints but they're allowed to work outside of those constraints and do the work that they're doing as well so it's been very very uh, different Okay, it'll be interesting. It'll be interesting to see yeah. if they can put together something more complete as far as documentary or um, I'm sure they're thinking about some kind of a documentary movie or something or probably a book or two or three. I don't know. But if I was on that project, those those would certainly be projects I'd be considering, if not having in the works. Yeah, I, I I think it's interesting what's going to happen. And part of me is like season three, there's a season four, is being aired now. Like every season Tuesday four. is a new show. Uh -huh. uh, but all this was filmed last year. Right. So if they found something, like if they uncovered, they dug a hole and they heard a ding, ding, because they hit the roof of a UFO, would they announce that, that they found it? Or would they wait for the airing of that show? Right. I'd like to think that the the discovery of that magnitude would be revealed immediately and not wait for the reveal of the show. Uh, so it's kind of like, so I guess they didn't find anything super compelling or we would have known about it already. Uh, I don't know, but yeah, the research they're doing is fascinating. Yeah. And it's always I, been a fascinating story. Jill had read all the Skinwalker Ranch stories before this was a show uh, oh. when it was Bigelow time uh, and okay. it was, you know, the Shermans and their experience with the animals. Okay. Yeah, I agree with that. We never charged for anything we did. Uh, charging kind of indicates the performance of a service with expectations of an outcome. Uh, mm -hmm. And you can't guarantee an outcome in anything we do. Uh, education would be something different if you were providing information for somebody, mm -hmm. not for a specific instance. Like, we're not investigating this house for education. We're, here's how to use the equipment. Here's mm -hmm. how to fine tune your psychic abilities. I have nothing against charging for a service that is educational, but right. if you're helping someone who has paranormal activity, it's kind of like a, it, it just sounds suspicious where oh, I think you got uh, demons uh, level three. That's the $500 package, or we could uh, insure you with holy water and, uh, and bless candles for 700. And it just, yeah. And we'll throw you know, in a little bit of um, salt here. That yes, uh, Morton's high grade salt. Yeah. Uh -huh. <laughs> That we've yeah, had blood yeah. from the, uh, the, the shop down the street that we just got his certificate yesterday. Uh, <laughs> I'm bad. I can't help it. I'm bad. That's always um, but it, it, it's a slippery slope, and it's something that I can't condemn somebody who charges for investigating if you're willing mm -hmm. to pay for it and, and everything. But for, for me, uh, as a, an investigator, I don't want that bias that... I have to, uh, I'm, you're paying me money to do something that I can't prove exists or prove right. I did anything different or. Mm -hmm. um, and when I'm working with a team doing an investigation, team doesn't charge. I don't charge. That's a whole different thing. When I'm teaching, I charge. When I'm giving readings, I charge, um, you know, things like that. Um, but that's different i'm providing a service it's a service i've been working on for decades literally yeah and yeah, um and i feel pretty good about it um but um but to go to somebody's house and i don't do it very often and because most of the people i've i've worked with aren't doing much right now as far as investigations and they only occasionally want a psychic mm -hmm. and I'm, I can do all the rest of the investigation, but they've already got people that can do it better, and I get bored. Yeah, oh, I'm sorry, I do. It's. Um, it's oh, we're gonna do this again. But yeah, it's, what I always, the part I love is being able to employ multiple psychics at the same location. Now, if we went to Walker Ames, there's a lot of. Uh, 
knowledge of the location. Mm -hmm. So that, that's like a, an entertainment investigation. Great place to right. go. Fabulous. If you get the opportunity, please do it. Yes. But in terms of that's in Port Gamble, everybody. Yeah. But in terms of when we're helping someone, it's a private home. There isn't a story that everybody knows about. So to have a psychic aid go through and and you had mentioned something important that you use a video camera because you if you, if you try to write down what you're thinking, you're going to lose it. Right. And so we have a psychic observer videotaping the psychic. So they don't even have to worry about the camera. They just. Oh, that's even better. And a little microphone clipped on so we can hear what they say. They don't have to yell it to the cameraman. The microphone yeah. is wirelessly transmitted from the, the psychic to the camera person. And so capture what they pick up as they go through the house. And then add psychic B. And if you have, like if it's a, a serious uh, situation, uh, maybe C, maybe D. And then you have four interpretations of four different people of what they picked up in the house. For me, being the observer of the data, that sounds funny, observer of data, but to then look at the reports of those four and see how they correlate to the actual paranormal phenomenon that's occurring in the house that's it's so compelling when you see that like out of four three of them are like exactly talking about what the client has mentioned is a, of concern uh, be it right physical activity or the location of that activity and right. there's no instrument in the world that can detect that right so i'm totally cognizant of my technology can only do so much there is something out there that technology can't detect and you need the human detector to go through and evaluate that. So it's really cool to get that that feedback of three people picked up the same thing and then kind of what should we do about it? And it ends up being like a psychic intervention kind of thing right. uh, with the spirits that are there if that's if they're communicative and mm -hmm. sentient and or at least identified. And I like cool. working with with people, teams, whatever doing reading you know, even things like EVPs and such, because the psychic can start out a lot of the questions. Um, it doesn't have to be anybody can do them, but when you see a little girl there that looks like she's 10 years old and wearing braids and has a brown jumper on, mm -hmm. um, you can ask that and see if there's anything that comes back then from the EVP, or if you have equipment that can be manipulated in such a way to give pretty accurate yes and no answers. I mean, if you've got a K2 meter, which are rubbish, I know, but if you've got one that's sitting still and you can have it move up to three, three lights for yes and four for no or something like that, and it's consistent, then there might mm -hmm. be something there. I'm not saying there is, but there might be. Or if you can get them to count, you know, consistently, it can be yeah. a, a help. But that way you've got the psychic who can tell, fill in the pieces that the tech can't. Um, yeah, yeah, very true. And I've seen, when I work with a group in Copenhagen, they use dowsing rods a lot. Now, there's two kinds of dowsing rods. One is like a Y. Uh -huh. You hold two Ys and the center stick douses or dips. That's and, what we always heard about as kids in storybooks. Yeah. And then the uh -huh. divining rods where you've got two, they're called uh, L pins. You got the two handles and the two rods. And if it crosses, and the whole thing that they taught me was you tell the sticks what your definitions are yes cross for yes open for no one of them actually along the length of his dowsing rod he did digits and then he would take them and say how old are you and he would use that as a means of detecting of having the spirit influence in the rods answer the question uh, but I've, then I've seen it expand. So Dallas Ronald was my first time I saw it done. I thought it was pretty clever. Um, right. Uh, and then the, uh, but you said it's consistency. Does it always work kind of thing? And, and it really does fill in the blanks for them. And the other way is having an EMF meter where you say, if you can influence my meter, and then you tell it, if you go up to the red light, that means this to me. 
And if you do the green light, right. that means that to me. But the problem yes. is it has to be repeatable. You yes. have to, like, are you a boy? It said, yes, it's a boy. Like, well, you had a 50-50 chance. And if you said, are you a girl? And it said, yes, again. Are we getting into the gender determination answers? Or is it that it really wasn't a yes in the first place? Or are there two separate individuals? Yeah, or the two people. So it's kind of like, I like to see when they ask the questions that once they get confirmation of what they think it is, they should ask questions again that would almost be opposite right if they get a no answer yeah because i think you're often, right yeah too often i see a narrative being created based on the narrative that the person asking the questions is building are you right. a little girl i said yes and and how old are you between seven and ten you know and, and they get yeses or nos and and then they have oh it's a 10 year old little girl and she was beaten to death and run over by a horse and i was like wow how did that happen? <laughs> and so I like to see more confirmation that your yes is always a yes. And yes. it wasn't just a random, the fridge went off and the EMF spiked at the same mm-hmm. time because your fridge started, your compressor went on, that you're right. communicating with a compressor and it just happens to line up with whatever question you were asking at that moment in time. Yeah. And that's part of why getting some of the basic ideas about the EMF in the building is so important. First, because one refrigerator compressor might send off emfs another one won't i've been by huge breaker box panels that by the time you're a foot away they're not emitting anything and others that you can be 10 feet away and it's like you're still getting readings from them so um you can't make an assumption um it's very true know the building and you had said it when you're in your own house it's like, oh, I know what that sound is. It's settling. It always does that. It's the left corner and the cell side. And it's investigators that go into a building for one night mm-hmm. and they go, lights off and they shut everything down and they're listening. It's like, oh my God, it's, the place was crazy. There's all kinds of sounds. Like, you've never been in that house. What sounds does it normally make? Like, is it normal? Is it not normal? And, it's 350 years old and it's over a rat's nest. It, yeah, it's, <laughs> you know? And it's like, and they've got this old air conditioner that makes this weird sound and they got an ice maker. And I can't uh-huh. tell you how many ice makers have terrified myself and my team on investigations. When you're walking through the haunted restaurant, and all of a sudden the ice maker goes <laughs> and starts spewing out cubes. <laughs> <laughs> but it, it's, it's when you investigate, it's knowing the surroundings you're in and what yes. is normal. Uh, yes. Trains. You know, if you live near a train, then that's normal for you. If you're not, it's like, holy geez, how do they live here? How can they sleep with all those trains? I actually live, well, I'm about 500 feet above the level of the train tracks in a mile or two away, I think. Uh And at night, I hear them softly. It's a wonderful sound. Yeah. But if that picked up, it would be distant enough. It could sound like an EVP. Yeah. But it isn't. It's yeah. the train that's down at the bottom of the cliff a couple miles away. Yeah. Uh, mm-hmm. When we had the luxury of time to be able to set up recording equipment and record the day before you investigate or get a sample day of recording house sounds, you know, their their air conditioning, their heating, their uh, the, the fluorescent lights when they're on make a noise. They, you know, when everything is on or off, the fans, just a regular day of, of, of regular life and then have that as a baseline of this is what normally happens in the house then you go in at night and do your investigation it's like everything's the same like that that's it always does that you know uh, i've been fooled by so many places like hearing a noise and inevitably i can find it it's like ah that's they have an electric my favorite the electric dust remover system and air conditioning it's a basically a, a a metal plate that the air passes through that's electrified and it's kind of like a bug zapper when you hear it going, you hear the little zappy signal noises of just the static as it accumulates while okay. it's working. And if you don't know about it, then it's like, what is this noise? And then it stops. The elusive, mm-hmm. not on all the time stuff. So yeah. I, I just love, I love that breaking it down and trying to find stuff. Yeah, I do too. And then in my house, for example, it's always cool when, okay. Yeah, there's nothing else that sounds like that except footsteps across the floor. Um, 
Mm -hmm. And I haven't been in that room for a while now. Um, I've been in my room. And so it's not like they just decided to spring up after I walked on them. Plus, the house is only 30 years old, not quite that old. Um, and um, the voices, the conversation, well, the radio's off. There's no sound outside. Um, okay, that's probably the usual party going on in here, mm -hmm. which with my family is pretty normal because we had parties all the time. Um <laughs> That's right. Like mic microphones, like let's put one in that room you don't go into. Let's put one in the room you stay in. Let's go. Let's put microphones everywhere because sound is interpreted. It's your right. ears hear it and interpret it into just like the diaphragm in a microphone, analog to electrical. Your brain is electrical. Mm -hmm. So did you get when you dream and you hear people talking to you, they're not going through your ear. They're straight to the electrical of your brain. Are right. these voices you hear in a house straight to the brain or are the acoustic in being going through your eardrums? And that's a good question. Um, and they're when I'm wide awake, it's not like I've heard them in my sleep and woken up. Yeah. Usually I can, but I, there it's usually while I'm awake, I haven't gone to sleep yet. Um, or I've woken up and then I hear them, but, mm -hmm. um, yeah, that's a really good question. I should do that. I don't, but I, on the other hand, I've got enough activity. I don't really need to yeah. stir up more by saying, let me put things out for you to play with. Yeah, we usually tell people, if you think your house is, parent, is haunted and there's activity, don't investigate it. Right. Because you Are can't you comfortable? Can leave. Yeah. <laughs> In, if you're going to. If you want to know because a lot of times, I, and especially if it's somebody who's experiencing it and they want to, and they want to what? Oh, I was gonna say if they want to, if they want to know more about what's going on, investigating it may make it worse, mostly because yes. they're not familiar with the equipment they'd be using. And mm -hmm. if you've been investigating for a while, like listening to EVPs, like Cliff listens to EVPs, there are certain sounds and characteristics that you can say, oh, that's not abnormal. That's just background noise that you don't notice, but is always there. So right. you can dismiss it. But if you've never listened to it, the first time you hear a voice recording of yourself, people don't recognize their own voice. Right. Bad enough in EVP. And so it just makes things worse because then they assume that anything they hear is if I can't explain it, it must be paranormal. So, but there's some instances where people are familiar with it, and then it's God bless you. Go ahead and, and you know set up recorders and see if you can find out more. But I always right. give that preface of if you're not familiar with it, I wouldn't recommend investigating. Have an outside party come in and assist you. Yeah, and even with that, um, if you're not afraid of what's there, if you're happy, because when you bring in a, an investigation. You're asking for whoever's there to, for, to do things. Mm. And you're saying, okay, I want you to be active now. And then when the investigation's over, it's okay, but now don't do it anymore. And it's, that's not always easy and it's not fair. <laughs> so No, it, it's, it's kind of, you know, train monkey thing. Yeah, and they 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 don't like that, and um, well, and it's just part of it. Depends on who's. I find mostly it's just part of our consciousness or our energy that we've, and it can be intelligent, but it, the soul's not there unless it's visiting. Mm -hmm. um, it's certainly not stuck, and my experience, mm -hmm. but. I can be controversial, I'm, I know. Let's see, Cliff just wrote something. There we both go. Fine press. Did you get a, a chance to read cases. all that? Yeah. We have a few cases that 
were alleged demonic activity. And being part of the Taps family, uh, we can call upon the demonologists that they have. And okay. so we have done that for a couple of cases. And they always said, carry a religious article with you that you believe in. Mm -hmm. And if there is evidence of demonic activity or anything of that nature, that the r religious relic will in fact heat up or react. And that was the, the benchmark for proceed with caution, of course. And mm -hmm. ideally you should just have someone come and help you. But in this right. case, we didn't, uh, but we had a lot of religious articles and nothing actually uh, reacted as a result. And it was okay. deemed that it wasn't demonic. It was just uh, unknown and uh, dark, uh, dark in nature. Yeah. Just people not of a demonic level. Yeah, there have been a lot of a lot of people weren't very nice to, in life. They don't necessarily leave behind something that's different. I can't see all of Cliffs. Did you see it's, it? Yeah, I see second part. Second part looks like first part. It, when you keep reading, it's different. Yeah, I, a lot of those are like very negative emotions. I think I'll, the word demon, it's, I have a problem. I, I don't use that term. To me, it's just like a dark either. energy or a light energy. And I find that dark energy feeds off of dark emotions or negative emotions. Uh, but in psychology, negative emotions tend to, to breed more negative emotions and uh, they always say you know think of what you want so think of positivity and right basically it doesn't make things more positive but you'll notice things that are positive and highlight them if you're thinking of negative and you're in a bad space it, then everything you think of is negative and you flag things that are negative around you saying see see uh, jill and i always use the example mm -hmm. of a, a pregnant woman or you your wife is pregnant you look around and it's like is there more people that are pregnant all of a sudden like and it's not that more right. people are with child. They're just, you're sensitive. Your, your filters are now open to pregnant women. And so you note them when you see them. So it seems like an increase. Uh, you buy a brand new red car and everyone around you seems to be having a, the same kind of car you have or the same red car kind of thing. Right. It's once you've accepted that, the thought of it's a demon, then you start to see things that you associate with demonology or uh, what was it, the power of good intention? I, I think is exactly that if you put it out about positive stuff then that's what you're going to notice disregard negative just don't think about it but if you think about it then you're going to notice it yeah and so perception almost and i don't personally believe in pure evil or demons um it's i have to see things to believe them i mean yeah, I, I believe I, I believe all the things that I believe because I've had direct physical experience that I can't explain away. Mm -hmm. And um, and often that's physically seeing something. And um, and I've worked with people in houses, too, that I've, we can draw them in. It's just like you were saying we can draw in the beings that feed off the energy that we're creating or and then they can help create more mess to create more of that energy they like so just you what you do is you change it you take the fights outside you don't watch scary programs you open the window shades you bring in flowers you play happier music um you change the vibe of the environment and either whatever being is there is going to go away or it's going to change to match that more positive energy. And yeah. it works often. Yeah, I agree with that. We've had a yeah. lot of cases that were around uh, people that hoard. Uh, basically, the, the energy was dead, not mm -hmm. like life 
dead, but there were just there was no activity. The air couldn't even move. The people couldn't walk through in a way that they wanted. Everything was dictated because there's just no path. Uh, right. And it was kind of like you need to, oh, as you said exactly, open up the windows, uh, put a few flowers in there, change the atmosphere, change the behavior. Because yes. I think like attracts like. Uh, yes. And you say, oh, you're in with a bad crowd. Well, then you start to become kind of like part of the bad crowd. And then you're part of the bad crowd. Now you are a bad crowd. Uh, if you hang around the, the not the bad crowd, then you tend to change in that behavior and be like a lighter people and happier. Then you tend to be lighter and happier. Right. Um, so like attracts like. And you draw more of those happier and lighter people to you and fewer of the bad crowd to you. Yeah, exactly. You won't be drawn to them. You won't start a conversation with them because they just, they don't vibe. Yeah. It's, it, we tell clients that go to other paranormal groups. I want you to find other groups to work with and pick the one that resonates with you. Right. So that your belief in what they're doing is true. If, if, mm -hmm. if you don't believe in the group you're, you're using, then you're not going to believe in their results or what they ask you to or suggest you should do. Um, right. Yeah, even exactly. people looking to join a paranormal group is see if the group resonates with what you believe is going on or is uh, meeting your needs and advances if you want to do things that way. Because mm -hmm. say every group does things in a different way. There's no wrong way. Well, that's not true. There are some things that are just outright wrong. Uh, right. But if you support that and you want to, you know, aid in that and, and knock yourself out. But it's so important to have that positive energy of I accept what you're doing and I want to help you do what you want to do. We'll help the group grow uh, just as helping a client who believes in what you're doing will help them uh, with positive results. Exactly. And the way the people, not just with the focus on the investigation and the results, but the way that people themselves in the group interact and, um, I think it's important to have fun with the people you're with. And if you're not going to be able to have fun with the people you're with, why spend all the misery when you're not even getting paid for it? I mean, sometimes exactly. you have to hang out with people you don't like when you're working, but at least you're getting paid to do that. Um, <laughs> yeah, very true. Yeah. Uh, and we watch a lot of murder mystery shows and true crime on TV. Uh -huh. And when you see that the husband killed the wife because he wanted a divorce, and we both of us look at each other, it's like, please just tell me you want a divorce. Don't kill me. Yeah. <laughs> and it's the same thing with life is too short to be investing time and energy in a group or an activity that you don't believe in or have a lot of like resistance. If something is hard to do, there's instances where you have to push through the hard to make it worth it, kind of like, you know, make your metal, forge your metal. And uh, right. I'm more of an advocate of if it's really too hard to move forward, maybe you're not going the right place. Exactly. Yeah. So I, I'm a big advocate of if things resonate with you, you'll know if it's worth the effort. Right. And if it doesn't resonate with you, then it's just going to be an uncomfortable situation and you're not helping yourself and you're probably not helping the group. That's right. Re-examine your motivation. And if it's because you've got a friend or two in the group that you want to hang out with and they seem to always be busy, we'll find other ways to hang out with them anyway, you know, if the group isn't going to fit. Yeah, because we have a film. Whisper does well because of the energy of the team. Mm -hmm. It was the people. Of, it's not, it's like any relationship. It's not always, you know, uh, you know rainbows and, and, and flowers, but it's always been worth it. It's always been worth that that you know let's let's get through this it's worth it in the end and it always has been uh, and all of the successes and because you know when you look in the things that happen in your life the opportunities that may have been presented to you in my case to the group um, mm -hmm. the opportunities far outweigh who we were we shouldn't have had some of those opportunities or or possibilities to investigate or facilitate or or assist people with but i felt that our good energy provided those good results and provide us with those opportunities. Yeah. Uh, no, that makes sense. And I don't know everybody that's part of whisper and has been over the years, but I know several people and 
I've really enjoyed every one of the people I've met. Um, and they're, you know, they have some of them different perspectives and, mm -hmm. and everything too. They're not cut cookie cutters of each other and what they bring to the, to the group. And that's important too. You, it's good to have a variety of respectful per perspectives. Yeah. I always said it, when you, when we were at a whisper event or a meeting, and Jill and I would say, like, we're like parents of, of, you know, proud parents of these children, is the members, we'd see the diversity, as you mentioned, different backgrounds, different beliefs, different um, thoughts. Uh, just, mm -hmm. And to me, you had to have that. If you go into anything with everyone thinking the same thing, then it's the a hammer and a nail. Everything right. is a nail if you're a hammer. And, you know, everything you approach is going to be the same. Everyone's going to, yes, that's what I would do. It was yep. always good to have these diverse opinions of what to do and how to do things. And, yes. and members come and go as, as uh, availability is available or not. Life changes. Mm -hmm. And I've always just been blessed with the different people that are part of Whisper that have advanced different things at different times. And, uh, and you mentioned at the beginning, it's, you like the talking to people. Is you learn from people, right. and I feel that every interaction there is something to be of benefit. And the best interaction is when both parties leave feeling like they they gained more than they offered, but both right. parties feel the same way. Exactly. Now, you know, I got a lot out of that. I feel like I didn't give enough, and the other person's thinking exactly the same thing. And exactly. That's like ideal situation. I agree. Well, and you and Jill are such good models of that. And the way you are with people and the way you approach all of this, I mean, it's natural that you attract um, a good mix this way. It's because that's who you are. Mm -hmm. So I appreciate it. I don't know if that came out yeah, right, again, that, but I appreciate it. Positive energy, the energy of attraction. Uh-huh. Yeah. yeah. It, it does. It's the, the power of attraction. Uh, the like attracts like. We kind of bring in the people that we're kind of work well with and benefit from without it has to be someone that's just like me it's no i i, I do me all day <laughs> I wanna, exactly i, wanna I like a break I wanna, yeah yeah <laughs> yeah because at, at one point we had someone that was from pest control services someone who did contracting for houses and framing and someone who was in the uh, law environment for legal system and, and police uh, procedures and, and such. And to have all those people together when you did an investigation, it was like, I can't believe that people don't seek out, like, I'm going to go to pest control and I'm going to find someone who's interested in the paranormal because knowing what type of species of bugs inhibit and inhabit a house at any moment in the year, what type of things infest uh, rats and, and mice and raccoons and just knowing that eliminated several cases just by knowing that well right now it's the uh, the heartworm and they make thumping noises in your wall at midnight and it was like things could be ruled out it's like what you need to do is you need to call orkin not two prices you need orkin yep. <laughs> exactly yeah or and the carpenter or the contractor carpenter well under a house of this age and this material is going to start making these kinds of sounds after a certain amount of time or and here's how you can fix it or um i mean just all kinds of things it's and the lawyers are how to serve um, eviction notices to the bugs in the wall with from orkin and um uh, i'm kidding but obviously but i mean Attorneys, I have paperwork that I had my attorney draw up. I've got release forms and stuff. And okay. there's a thinking, uh, the way an attorney's mind is trained to work, and depending on the type of law, is a very good investigation um, type of, and fact-finding. And, I mean, there are all kinds of really... Val valuable skill sets that come with all of these professions yeah, and definitely. i think with most people if they allow it to happen but agree the, the strength was in diversity yes yeah 
Yes. Well, Darren, we have been going for two hours, nine minutes, and 40 seconds. Um, this is great, but we might want to... I shall document that data point. Okay. Um, <laughs> oh, let's see. I, I don't know. Oh, no need to apologize. No, uh-uh. No, it didn't. I mean, it's a, I, I, it, the, the use of demons or, or to me it's it's a each person has their own because it's a very belief based concept and right. my personal view is i don't like to call things demonic because if you do then the uh, if if i'm dealing with a client who thinks it's demonic and i use the word demonic then it's kind of like oh, he repeated it back it must be true and then they latch right. onto that like a bear trap right so if you just and because I believe Cliff, you mentioned that it's the really negative energies or spirits. And so mm -hmm. that's really true. Uh, it's, I believe it's more the negative energies. Now, John Zaffis, who's got a lot more experience than I ever will on this, has had instances where he has had demonic interaction. Uh, but in my, in all our cases we've ever done, we've never had that. We had what we thought could have been, and it turned out it didn't to uh -huh. our great relief. Uh, I'm just, I just choose not to use the word because if you use the word, then the recipient will, uh, it just reinforces that. It's kind of like the like attracts like. So if you kind of stay right. away from the word, uh, and one of the biggest things is as a group, if everyone gets together after and they're all discussing, he's like, oh man, I felt like demonic activity. If the client is overhearing that, they're going to think that that's what it is. It's demonic activity and you're not telling them. And we've gotten into a lot of instances where clients overheard team members talking and what they say and the words they use would basically say never use that in front of people because this is how they will react to what you said. Yes. Yes. And um, and thank you, Cliff, for those kind words. Um, I agree. And you know, when I say I don't believe in such and such, doesn't mean I'm not open to it. I don't have any experience. I can't I, my own philosophy and spirituality doesn't really recognize them as, mm -hmm. you know, I don't, I don't recognize, I don't see pure good or pure evil as part of the reality of this world. And that's all. And yeah. Yeah. when you, you base your belief off of experience, yes, uh, you're open to it. But until you've actually had the experience firsthand, you can't definitively say it's true or it isn't. That. And the yeah. same here, I've never had that. And a lot of it is it's a religious construct and definition. So if I'm not of that religion, does that mean I can't use that word? Like, what is the equivalent? So I think dark energy kind of covers it quite nicely. Mm -hmm. yeah. And well, even with that, that's a whole nother show. I mean, <laughs> the, early Christ the early church took all the uh, pagan deities and gave them the names of demons instead of uh you know they were gods now they're demons so um <laughs> uh credibility issues but darren i have really enjoyed this and is there anything that you want to get out there before we end the live part anyway uh to still, um, I'm working on building what we're doing here in Kansas. I'm trying to find a different d lettering because WH definitely won't fly here. Right. <laughs> Unless I make it like woo, who. <laughs> uh, but the name is less important than, than the work that we do. Yes. Uh, it's yes. like carry on what we're doing. You know, we've always had a very good reputation within the industry, industry, yes. uh, other paranormal groups that we've worked with. And I've always told the team it's respect is everything and reputation. Mm -hmm. uh, you, you, you can only build a reputation. You can't make a reputation. That's right. And you, know, you can destroy them pretty fast. Exactly. It's like, it's the only thing we have is our reputation. So yeah. be conscious of that. And so that's what every whisper member, lives and breathes as Darren says we're about you know respect and and the reputation of the group so we plan on doing good things that Washington State should get more active as cases come in they've been few and far between uh, yeah. looking for some activities to do there uh, that COVID changed so much uh, it, 
for good in some cases, for bad in others. But it's definitely been a it's been a ride. Yes, it has. Well, maybe you two will decide to come up to the Port Gamble conference in November. Yeah, that would be cool. Come back to yes. some of those conferences. Really enjoyed those. Yeah. Yeah. I guess have your pet spayed and neutered. Uh, I love it. What a perfect way to end a, a metaphysic paranormal show. <laughs> yeah. Darren, Positivity. thank you again. Yep. Thank you, William. And it's been a pleasure. Every, everybody who's watched, thank you. And um, we'll see you next time. You got it. <laughs>